I think people would be surprised to know how little happens around here without the Allegheny Conference's involvement. There wasn't a model really for the Allegheny Conference to follow anywhere in the United States. It was set up as how could the business community work together to rebuild this city. Pittsburgh is the site of probably the best transformation of a post-industrial city in the last 25 years. We're attracting people from around the country who want to live in a place called Pittsburgh. The conference has a long history in partnering with the city of Pittsburgh government. There's a buzz about Pittsburgh today uh, that didn't exist 10 or 15 years ago. Our priorities for the region really come down to, first and foremost, uh, workforce development and talent attraction. And you know, when I look back upon the conference, uh, I'm totally amazed by its proactive initiatives in terms of remaining relevant. We really are a unique place in terms of people collaborating in order to make good things happen. Beyond that, there was a kind of a mystique about the Allegheny Conference for a young lawyer like me. Davy Lawrence and R.K. Mellon in 1944 uh, deciding we needed to all come together to work on air and water quality, which, by the way, surprises many people when I tell them that our roots are as an environmental organization. As Henry Hillman used to say, if the Allegheny Conference ceased to exist, we'd have to invent it all over again. It was the summer of 1943. World War II's tide of battle was turning at last. The Allies were gaining across the globe. The tide had turned because of the bravery and sacrifice of our troops. But it also turned because of the unprecedented output of military hardware. Everything from sidearms to battleships built from American steel in American factories. And if America was the arsenal of democracy, Pittsburgh was its crucible, its mills forging the essentials of war three shifts a day, 365 days a year. When you got to the 1940s, uh, Pittsburgh was in a remarkably uh, powerful position. I mean, during World War II, they, they always tell us that uh, Pittsburgh produced more steel than Germany and Japan combined. Uh, it was an incredible story. And making money hand over fist. I mean, anybody in Pittsburgh who could work in the 1940s was working. But uh, they had a problem at the same time, and it began to dawn on civic leaders that, that Pittsburgh in those days, in the 40s, was really living up to its name. It was truly a pit. Uh, environmentally, it was uh, a, a really terrible place. And while the war was far from won, the production demands far from finished, Pittsburgh's most far-sighted political and industrial leaders were already concerned about their post-war city. Remember in 1943, World War II was entering its final phases, so an end was in sight. So it was time for a city like Pittsburgh, which was a suffering city with smoke and dirty rivers, to attempt to clean itself up if it was going to compete in what would be a growing future after the war. Some community leaders met with Mr. Mellon, who then was a general in the Army in Washington, and uh, he blessed the idea. Mr. Mellon was Richard King Mellon, the scion of a family that had already contributed so much to the city. And the idea brought to Mellon was for the formation of a top-level planning council for Pittsburgh. Civic leaders here became concerned that without the artificial stimulus of the war effort, uh, that Pittsburgh really wouldn't be able to compete once World War II was over. So in 1943, uh, I think it was the uh, president of Carnegie Tech actually suggested the idea of forming a committee for post-war planning uh, that would really begin to discuss what do we do. Planning was nothing new to Pittsburgh. In that summer of 43, half a dozen master plans were gathering dust on governmental and academic shelves. What was missing was an organizational structure, an entity that would be able to harness the best thinking, but more importantly, would have the economic and the political clout to bring into reality a true post-war plan. And so in fall 1943, the chief executives of most of Pittsburgh's businesses, including Heinz, Buell, Mellon, Dravot, PPG, Alcoa, U.S. Steel, and Kaufman, 
came together with labor, political, and educational leaders to incorporate the Allegheny Conference on Post-War Community Planning, soon renamed the Allegheny Conference on Community Development. This is the story of the Allegheny Conference, of the men and women who built the dynamo that powered Pittsburgh through three periods of renaissance. The war was over, we were happy about that, but as far as the economy went and as far as the uh, the uh, development of uh, progressive government. It was uh, a bit of a doldrums, but it was sparked and brought back to life through the Allegheny Conference on Community Development. Immediately after the war, the conference took on two age-old Pittsburgh problems, smoke and water. When I was uh, in kindergarten, we had the in the area the St. Patrick's Day flood that inundated Pittsburgh and, and literally covered all of the major uh, uh, buildings other than the skyscrapers in the city. And I remember very well my parents as a special treat took me as a four-year-old, if you can believe that, it's one of my earliest memories, up to uh, Mount Washington. And we looked down from Mount Washington on the city and that memory is fixed in my mind inexorably. The flood that Governor Thornburg saw as a boy was devastating two-thirds of the city underwater, 74 lives lost, 10,000 people rendered homeless, millions of dollars in property and business losses. And so Allegheny Conference leaders took on the flooding problem. They lobbied the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania in support of nine upriver dams that brought the city its first real flood control. But they went further, presenting their first urban improvement plan, for a 36-acre park at the point where the Monongahela and the Allegheny join to form the mighty Ohio River. Point State Park, many improvements later, remains a jewel of the city, a tribute to the visionary leadership of the conference's early days. When you come through that tunnel, that Fort Pitt tunnel, and take a look at that fountain in that park sitting there, it is a real statement to visitors. And every once in a while we forget that Sunday Magazine named the view from Mount Washington overlooking the rivers and Point State Park as the number one view in America. After tackling the flood issue, Allegheny Conference leaders took on smoke control. Pittsburgh really was uh, hell with the lid off. If you see photographs of what downtown Pittsburgh looked like at those times, People had to, uh, workmen had to change their shirts midday because they'd be blackened by soot. The air was terribly unhealthy. I am convinced that our people want to clean up the air. There is no other single thing which will so dramatically improve the appearance, the health, the pride, the spirit of the city. Mayor David L. Lawrence. Through a series of comprehensive regional smoke control ordinances in 1946, all sponsored by the conference, the problem was largely gone within a year. Old timers remember that the winter of 1946-47 was Pittsburgh's last black winter. But of course, old memories die hard. Pittsburgh's uh, transition from the smoky city to today and I guarantee you 50% of Americans still think of it as the smoky city. Images change very slowly. What made all of this work was bringing together, in an unprecedented way, political leadership and the business community. I think all the corporations were ready for it. It took some uh, work by the uh, uh, the conference and by uh, important business leaders in, in banking, R.K. Mellon, uh, in politics, the mayor of Pittsburgh, Dave Lawrence. David L. Lawrence was without question the pivotal political figure in the birth of the conference. During his 13 years as Pittsburgh's mayor, he presided over the conference's transformation from a loosely organized band of public-spirited business people to become the first true redevelopment board in the city. The Allegheny Conference 
approached Mayor Lawrence and asked if he would consider uh, appointing a board. A redevelopment of board consists of five people appointed by the mayor. And the conference also said it would be good if you'd appoint yourself chairman. He was very careful. Of the five people he appointed, three were Republicans and two were Democrats, so he made it absolutely a non-political board. This is a Pittsburgh project, not a Democratic or a Republican project. There is no such thing as a Democratic bridge or a Republican highway. Mayor David L. Lawrence. So those were the big four planks or the foundation pieces of Renaissance One around smoke control, urban redevelopment, flood control, and water quality. With cleaner air and floods abated, conference leadership was ready to turn to a significant reworking of Pittsburgh's cityscape. The concept was called urban renewal, and it was led by Pittsburgh Urban Redevelopment Authority, created under the auspices of the Allegheny Conference. The Allegheny Conference was set up as a civic activity for the business corporations in Pittsburgh. It was not set up as a uh, business lobbying group. It was set up as how could the business community work together to rebuild this city. So its function was rebuilding the city in many ways through corporate leadership. It's kind of bookended by the idea that we should build a park and a fountain in, at, at, at the point, and that's Point State Park and its fountain. They started talking about that in 1944, and they turned the fountain on in 1974. It took 30 years, but that was truly Renaissance One, and all those grand plans happened, and, and the city was in many ways transformed. The leadership in that time left a great legacy um, for future generations to build on. Um, they created the Urban Redevelopment Authority, the Pittsburgh Parking Authority, the Stadium Authority, the Public Auditorium Authority, the Pittsburgh Housing Authority. All of these agencies were absolutely critical to the redevelopment of Pittsburgh. Urban redevelopment during Renaissance I saw a dismal train yard turned into Gateway Center, the first major public-private downtown development project in the United States after World War II. Gateway Center remains today, nearly 70 years later, a vibrant and functional office complex. Renaissance I also saw the building of Chatham Center, the Washington Plaza Apartments, and Allegheny Center, but not all of the urban renewal projects were as successful. Some remain controversial. There were some things that did not work out in, in the Pittsburgh area, in part by a little bit too much city planning. The building, for example, of the Civic Arena, which cleared out too much of the lower hill district of Pittsburgh, the people who made the decisions to clean up the air and the water also made the decision to racially segregate the families of the Hill District and render black families to several generations of dependents um, in public housing. East Liberty is another case where a traffic pattern w was too radical imposed on an, an area that had some viable businesses and it was, it was a lively business street. And along came a great city plan to change the whole traffic pattern. I think it destroyed a lot and I believe a lot of city planners would, would agree. The, re the urban redevelopment plan to revitalize East Liberty. And from there, they kept moving me from there to Mark Rether Street to Highland Avenue. And then they got the bright idea to make a circle in East Liberty. So there's five big shot stores that were instrumental in doing that. Well, naturally, it turned out to be a failure. Everyone went bankrupt. And East Liberty went downhill. And I survived East Liberty all those years when nothing else survived. 
Instead, what they managed to achieve was they drove a stake through the neighborhood's heart that essentially has taken 30 years to undo. Back in the 1960s and 70s, I, when I'm speaking to people, I sort of, I always say, so how many architects and planners are in the room? And when they raise their hand, I say, what were you all smoking and drinking in the 60s and 70s? Because if you think of uh, the civic arena, which demolished uh, half the Hill District, and you think of uh, East Liberty, which was a failed urban renewal project in the 60s, you sort of scratch your head and say, what were they thinking about? Even Three River Stadium. Uh, Three River Stadium with, you know, 25 acres of surface parking. Pittsburgh may have had its stumbles in the urban renewal process, but the issues were symptomatic of the times. Pittsburgh was not alone in that. You can look at cities across the country in the 1960s, and that was the philosophy. You know, these were blighted areas. They had to be torn down. New investments had to be made. Big, spectacular uh, public investments. And maybe they forgot that uh, you know, somebody, one person's blight is somebody else's home, it's somebody else's neighborhood. And there's nobody more uh, committed ultimately to the recovery of those communities than people who live in those communities. And, and when you displace them and you destroy those people who really care, it takes a long time to find your way back. And, and I think that may be one of the lessons of the 60s and what happened here. With lessons learned from Renaissance One, Pittsburgh was ready for its second Renaissance. Renaissance II became kind of a term of art um, in the city in the late 70s and early and mid 80s uh, in Pittsburgh. In Dick Caligiuri's first inaugural address, he called for a second Renaissance in Pittsburgh. Renaissance II is a matter of the quality of life as we live it in our neighborhoods and in the Golden Triangle as we enjoy it in our homes our workplaces, our centers of education, and entertainment. Mayor Richard Caligiuri. Mayor Richard Caligiuri's announcement of a new renaissance as he took office in 1977 was aimed at picking up the torch that Mayor David Lawrence had lighted. And Caligiuri continued to depend on the Allegheny Conference in confronting the serious economic challenges the city would face. Mayor Caligiuri was very, very well-respected in the community, and nearly every member of the conference uh, listened carefully to what he wanted to do, and uh, where we could, we supported his efforts, and, and uh, conversely, he supported the, the corporate efforts when we needed help from either the county or the, or the city. With the cooperation of the city administration, the Allegheny Conference took leadership in the development projects of the 1980s that forever changed the character of downtown Pittsburgh. Oxford Center, Liberty Center, Federated Investors Tower, the Doubletree Hotel at Bigelow Square. But most spectacularly, PPG Place and the Cultural District. PPG Place is now perhaps the most recognizable structure in the city, a world-famous Philip Johnson design, six buildings stretching over three city blocks, a million and a half square feet of office space, and encompassing Market Square, the vibrant center of winter and summer outdoor life in the heart of the city. Mayor Caligari's hope was that he could leave behind a building one of the most magnificent buildings in the country. So he and Vince Sarney worked tirelessly for a couple years to try to get acquire the property and move forward with what is, I think, one of the most breathtaking buildings in the region. If the Allegheny Conference's work in Renaissance II had been nothing but PPG Place and the other downtown skyscrapers, it would have been a success. But everyone who visits the city today owes perhaps an even greater debt to the conference for its role in the creation of the cultural district. If you visit the busy theaters, restaurants, shops, and galleries today, you might have a hard time imagining what this eight block area in the heart of the Golden Triangle once was. When I first came to Pittsburgh, uh, what do we now call the cultural district was a red light district. It was a mess. Jack Hines said it was a cultural district. People laughed. 
So Jack Hines in the 70s, he loved Hines Hall, he loved the orchestra and all of the arts, but he began to think about what he could do to further expand the reach of the arts and culture in Pittsburgh and protect Hines Hall. And so the idea of a cultural district was born. The corporations and the public sector came together in a way that over a long period of time, we've spent hundreds of millions of dollars. Foundations have been so powerful in that district, along with corporations, and the public partnership has been great too. The Allegheny Conference was very important to the development of the district and all of the early planning. So it's been named the number one cultural district in America. We've got a, a downtown that's alive and vibrant, and that's truly driven by a partnership between what I would call the cultural trust, which is a not-for-profit, plus all the corporations that call downtown their home. If the most visible symbols of Renaissance II were in bricks and mortar, there were other unique opportunities where the combination of the Allegheny Conference's economic clout coupled with political will accomplished unexpected results, like saving the pirates. The mayor came to see me and said, Doug, is there <laughs> any scheme that you might come up with that would facilitate keeping the, uh, the pirates in, um, in, in Pittsburgh? And of course, again, I called my peers in the in business community and, and a few private individuals. And it was a partnership, again, between the city and, and the, the corporate community, largely, in the, the area. And uh, we did this in 1986. Uh, and uh, at the, uh, and when I retired from Westinghouse, my alleged friend said, uh, you got us into this, would you run it? And of course I was happy to do that and enjoyed doing it for many years. But that's an example of uh, corporate cohesiveness, if you will, and willingness to, if you will, stick our neck out to do something different than other communities perhaps have, have done. Yet even as the Allegheny Conference and city leaders celebrated the triumphs of Renaissance II, the conference was faced in the 1980s with Pittsburgh and the region's biggest economic crisis since the Depression, the collapse of the American steel industry. Between 1980 and 1988, one by one, the great steel plants throughout the region closed their doors, often with little notice, but with devastating effect. So there was a depopulation that went along with the loss of manufacturing jobs. And by the mid 80s, Pittsburgh was in dire straits as a result. Pittsburgh hit bottom in 1983. Unemployment rate was 17% and 50,000 people a year were leaving Pittsburgh. Former steel workers all over Pittsburgh still recall vividly the day the mill shut down. Men like Frank and John and Pete and Rich still meet at neighborhood restaurants like Sheila's. They meet and they remember. It was disastrous. Uh, my brother came to work and the gates were locked by the security guards and they told them to come back the next day to be ready to clean out their lockers. It's over. And he broke down sobbing, crying and uh, called me at home and says, don't bother come out to work. There is no more work. So everything was going along fine. Then they invite us up to the Fez for dinner, telling us what it's going to be like, how wonderful it's going to be like. Six months later, no job. And by the time the steel mills were done and U.S. Air was done, the whole community changed over to different people with different jobs who couldn't afford the homes. In fact, my brother was six doors down from me, Steve, God bless his soul. He lost his house. I'll tell you, it was a scary time in my life. It was, it was rough. It was a very sad time. By 1988, there was only one major steel plant still operating in the steel city. So there were an awful lot of folks that had lost jobs and we knew we had to create new opportunities and new jobs for people. But also it resulted in a lot of derelict industrial sites uh, that mainly lined our rivers, uh, both here and throughout the, the Mon Valley. 
So it became particularly important to find reuses for those sites. One of the very first uh, in this region was what became the Pittsburgh Technology Center. And that was a, a joint undertaking of the City of Pittsburgh, the University of Pittsburgh, and Carnegie Mellon University. It was the old Jones and Laughlin hot and cold uh, strip mills. Um, the, the sites were cleared um, using uh, state and federal dollars. That site now is completely redeveloped and became a model for other brownfield developments. A city that didn't have the sort of amazingly insightful long-term leadership represented by the Allegheny Conference might have lost hope. But from its earliest days, the conference was acutely aware of the over-dependence on a single industry. And one of the things those civic leaders decided to do, again, many of Pittsburgh's first families, was to begin to invest in our colleges and universities and understanding how critical the universities were going to be to Pittsburgh's future. They began to build facilities. They began to recruit top talent. Good examples are Jonas Salk, and who brought his team here and ultimately created the polio vaccine. Another one was Dr. Spock, Benjamin Spock, the baby doctor. But it wasn't because of something that happened as a result of the industrial collapse. It was really the result of planning that had begun in the 1940s and 50s. A key strategy that drove the economic recovery of Renaissance II that was spearheaded by the Allegheny Conference became known as Strategy 21. Part of the task that uh, was undertaken uh, during the mid-1980s uh, by the Allegheny Conference was working with business and labor and uh, community leaders to develop an overall strategy to jumpstart uh, the economy of the region in a positive way. And it resulted in something called Strategy 21. I still have my marked up copy of it. <laughs> And uh, that was brought to us uh, in 1986 by uh, Tom Forster, then county commissioner, and uh, the folks who had worked together with the conference uh, and Bob Pease and his leadership uh, as a wish list, frankly and openly, of things that the state could help in developing. And it was a comprehensive list. It, it met social needs, it met economic needs, it met educational needs, transportation needs. The whole nine yards was wrapped up within Strategy 21. Strategy 21 also included one of America's first and most successful brownfield development projects. So even though the Allegheny Conference of Community Development was not on the cover of Strategy 21, we all know that they were behind the scenes making it happen. Few urban regions could have absorbed the blow dealt us by the loss of our number one industry. But Pittsburgh, Allegheny County, and our whole region did. Thanks in no small measure to the vision, the wisdom, and the members of the Allegheny Conference. What you see now is a vibrant community uh, on, the, on the leading edge of medical research, incredible things accomplished in our research communities, and the uh, translation of those into economic development opportunities. The beginnings of our third renaissance coincided with the 1994-2005 tenure of Pittsburgh's 56th mayor, Thomas J. Tom Murphy. In the 90s and into the 21st century, the city administration and the Allegheny Conference continued to rigorously pursue the public-private strategy that had worked so well throughout Renaissance I and II. The results were spectacularly successful bringing in over four and a half billion dollars to a series of Pittsburgh projects that opened their doors between 2000 and 2005. Heinz Field, home of the Pittsburgh Steelers and the Pitt Panthers football team. The David L. Lawrence Convention Center, one of the largest green buildings in the nation, named of course for one of the founding fathers of the conference. And PNC Park, home of the Pittsburgh Pirates. I was asked to be on the committee that chose the site and design for PNC Park. It is nice to know that PNC Park is now considered the jewel of baseball parks in America. In addition to the newest building boom, 
Renaissance III saw the development of more than 25 miles of recreational trails, urban green spaces, and river access. Initially, people couldn't see the value of, particularly back in the mid-90s, couldn't see the value of a trail. They didn't, they saw their piece of property as a piece of property, not as a strategy, part of a larger strategy. And, and so when people began to understand that this wasn't just um, a, a half a mile of trail, but it was going to be 335 miles of trails uh, that we were putting together, they, they began to understand the, the bigger vision. And that's where the Allegheny Conference really became a very important player because we had done much of the city and um, from McKeesport down, the, much of the trail to Washington was done. Uh, that was the big hole. Uh, and the Allegheny Conference really adopted making, making getting it finished. The transformation of the region has allowed my family and me to experience this beautiful city. We can go out on a weekend, take a 20 mile bike ride on the trails, go jogging and experience the rolling hills, the beautiful rivers, even downtown on an up close and personal basis rather than driving by at 60 miles an hour. 25 years ago when we moved here, I would have never dreamed that was possible. Beyond quality of urban life, Renaissance 3 is profoundly focused on renewing the sense of community that has always characterized Pittsburgh. You know, when you think of uh, economic development organizations, you think of how do we make companies bigger and more profitable. But I think what's been unique about the Allegheny Conference is it's focused on the community as well. I have seen demonstrations of the best practices of Pittsburgh reflected in its communities. The Lawrenceville revitalization, South Side revitalization, the revitalization that's going on in the North Side, one of the projects being the Federal North Project. Secondly, I think you're seeing a re-urbanization of the inner city. People are moving from the suburbs back to the city, reclaiming brownstones, renovating those brownstones, and making investments in those communities. Thirdly, we're attracting people from around the country who want to live in a place called Pittsburgh for all the variety of reasons, cultural institutions, IT opportunities, new manufacturing opportunities, uh, biotech, med tech, not to mention the intellectual resources of the University of Pittsburgh, Carnegie Mellon, and others. So I think when you add all that up, it represents a very robust and very exciting future for a region that many people wrote off 30, 40 years ago. But for the communities to be solvent and strong, at base there must be a vigorous economy, a diverse and regional economy. There have to be jobs today and preparation for the jobs of tomorrow. The regional economic challenge is foremost in the thinking and planning of the conference's current leadership. There are five core sectors that are driving the economy. No one of them represents more than 23% of the regional economy. All of them have potential growth potential. And in no particular order, they're advanced manufacturing, energy, finance and related business services, healthcare, um, and then the information technology sector. We've gone from an economy that was very dependent on one sector, uh, almost 50% of one sector back in the 70s, to an economy that's very balanced and diversified. We learned our lesson as the steel industry declined and as we went into crisis. We now employ more people in southwestern Pennsylvania than we did at the height of the steel industry. So when we look across uh, the country and we see what other regions are doing to compete in a global marketplace, you have to act as a region. Like it or not, it is a global economy. and. And the parochial interests or the traditional interests of focusing on what makes us comfortable um, is not only not the right thing to do, it's not going to work from the standpoint of ongoing development. If you go back to the beginning, which uh, would be the, the mid to late 40s in the, in the city of Pittsburgh, it was the, uh, the corporate leadership and the government leadership in the person of Governor Lawrence and Richard King Mellon that really started the rebirth of Pittsburgh. So you had uh, all 
men, white men, who headed these Fortune 100s, uh, who were highly successful and some would say uh, intensely competitive. And yet, when it came to the community, they had the ability to sit down around the table and say, this is good for our region. We need to put our own self-interest aside. And they established that feeling throughout the organization, and, and it remains today. Mayor Lawrence saw it as a partnership in order to be able to take care of the big, big problems, the, the cleaning of the air, the, 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 the ending of the flooding, the, the ability to transform downtown. Uh, Mayor, Mayor Caligiuri stood on those shoulders and saw a transformation continue, especially within the corporate community and the skyscrapers that were built during the 80s. And Mayor Murphy took that along the riverfronts to see uh, an area that was only used for industrial purposes become multi-use. I've always said one sector, the private sector alone, couldn't do it. The public sector alone couldn't do it. But together, they could do a lot. And I think the history of Pittsburgh proves that. Not only did the Allegheny Conference from its founding involve the true leadership of Pittsburgh, it adopted a set of procedures that made sure the best and most lasting decisions could be made. The conference board, for example, it's a CEO-only board. You have to show up in person, you can't call in. It requires personal involvement. And interestingly, that's not the case in most other places around the United States. If you wanted something major that you thought was important, you could really call 10, 12 CEOs, explain what you wanted to do, and get them on board, and the response nearly always was very positive. Never when you were called, you never said no, because uh, the next time it was maybe your venture that you wanted to pursue, or your program, and you would expect them to respond. And almost invariably, the corporations did respond, because uh, we all had a a uh, definite interest in the community, the betterment of the community. The Allegheny Conference stands for thoughtful progress in economic development, carefully planned out. These were businessmen. They were used to doing things in an organized way, not off the top of their heads. They had a plan. They had a plan like Strategy 21 that was developed with community needs in mind, but attentive to practical ways to solve the problems of getting the job done. Uh, we met over lunch at the Duquesne Club, uh, several committees within the conference, uh, Finance Committee, Educational Committee, Development Committee. The common interests of all those executives to have a better community, a better working environment, a, a place where they could gather to, to discuss that stuff, frankly, out of hearing of, uh, of uh, people taking minutes and, and recording it, it has been generally a good thing. And I'll bet they have ended up brainstorming a lot of great stuff. The conference has developed a powerful set of traditions that have been carried on through each generation of succeeding leadership. The reason why the conference has been so successful is the unique leadership that all of these people brought to the betterment of the region and the recognition that as leaders, whether they be CEOs, whether they be leaders of the foundations, um, whether they be um, uh, the Henry Hillmans of the world, whomever it may have been, recognize that they had a responsibility to the community. I've always felt that, that I had an obligation to continue the legacy that they started. I mean, the energy and the effort and the vision that they saw for the region and the motivation to help people. Being part of the leadership of the conference meant being willing to participate in a unique arrangement, a public-private partnership that has brokered virtually every major change in the region. All over the country and indeed around the world, the Allegheny Conference on Community Development is recognized as the classic public-private partnership. The Allegheny Conference in Community Development was absolutely indispensable in forging that partnership and nourishing it and helping it to grow over the years. When I do go to national conferences, it's viewed as a model for how you go about organizing economic development and public policy and then executing on that. 
The private part of the public-private partnership meant drawing from the top echelons of Pittsburgh's corporate change-makers. You see prominent families like Hillman and Hines and Mellon and Scaife and so on, who are no strangers to this community, who are active and visible in the community, and care about its well-being, both in the present and, and well into the future. That's unique and very exciting. My legacy will be that I was a part of a, a, a really I'll say powerful group of folks who were passionate about making a difference. If the top leadership at the beginning formed from a narrow band of the very top corporate CEOs, the conference has recognized the need to change with the times. I do believe that the Allegheny Conference could be challenged for its commitment to being inclusive. It depends on what time frame you're looking at. If you look at 30 or 40 years, it's not, you, it's indefensible. <laughs> if you look at uh, the last 10 years, getting better. And if you look at the last few years, really, there's been a lot of progress. Back in the 40s and 50s, it was a small cadre of people. The, the power base has been distributed more now because our economy is more diverse. The region had changed. The attitudes had changed. We needed to certainly be more inclusive than we were. I can recall a chairing the nominated committee of the conference uh, and happily was able to bring aboard as her first female first lady, Dr. Karen Feinstein. It was an honor to be asked to be the first woman to serve on the Allegheny Conference. And I think part of it was my activities getting engaged in some of the big policy issues of the day. You don't just get picked to be on the conference board because you have a nice tie on. You get picked because you have something that brings uh, improve value to the conference strategy. In the end, the common leadership characteristic of the conference is public spirit. You need visionary leaders who are constantly looking for a common ground as opposed to um, uh, their own unique uh, interests. At the core of every conference success, linking the political and economic leaders has been a remarkable professional staff. For 22 years, from 1968 to 1990, the conference's executive director was Bob Pease, who came to the conference from the Urban Redevelopment Authority. Bob Pease was a mentor for me. He was a guy who was running the Allegheny Conference. It's a big deal. And uh, put his arm around me and explained to me how the community worked. Bob Pease was an extraordinarily uh, fine early supporter and leader in the development of the cultural district. Trained as an engineer and an honored World War II vet, Bob had a deep understanding of the importance of community development alongside economic development. Bob also had the political savvy to get projects designed, funded, and built. And he was also attuned to all segments of the community with a commitment to inclusiveness. Reverend Jimmy Joe Robinson tells of a remarkable meeting. Bob was instrumental in uh, setting up uh, a meeting with community activists and uh, with uh, members of the Allegheny Conference. I was able pretty much to get 10 black community leaders. And Bob was able to get, including himself, eight of the most powerful men in Pittsburgh. And for, for me to invite them to a meeting like that, they, well, I had a little bit of uh, fuzz in those days, a little bit of power myself, but they trusted me enough to be willing to come to the table. After Bob Pease, for over a decade of remarkable continued achievement, the chief executive officer was Richard Rick Stafford now Distinguished Service Professor at the Heinz School of Public Policy and Management at Carnegie Mellon University. During his tenure, Stafford led conference initiatives in public governance, regional economic strategy, workforce development, and education. Well, the Pittsburgh region is uh, endowed with, uh, or saddled with, depend on how you want to rephrase it, um, 
a great deal of fragmentation governmentally. So it makes it particularly challenging at times to bring people together to make decisions that will affect uh, uh, public policy and, and, and public investment. Um, and that's where I think uh, an organization like the conference can make a, r a real contribution. When Rick Stafford stepped down, the reins of conference leadership were taken up by Mike Langley, whose tenure was marked by the conference's role in the celebration of Pittsburgh's 250th anniversary. With the current leader, Dennis Yablonski, the tradition of well-prepared and community-centered focus continues. Interestingly, uh, all three of my professional experiences kind of prepared me well for this job. I mean, I spent 24 years in the private sector running technology companies, and I deal with businessmen and businesswomen all the time. I spent four years uh, building uh, technology incubators, which got me into very detailed work with the universities and the hospitals and with government a little bit. And then I spent six years in government. When I leave the conference, I'm not going to go to Cleveland or Baltimore or anyplace else. I could not do this anywhere but, but Pittsburgh. This is a labor of love for me, and, uh, and I hope that um, I'll leave the place a little better than I found it. The Allegheny Conference, as we have seen, began with a small group of industrial leaders, city officials, university-based intellectuals, and professional planners. The group could conveniently meet around a table at Pittsburgh's elite Duquesne Club. Today, the conference is much more, a complex organization with a structure that allows for comprehensive thinking and planning for today and for the future. We think the organizational model that the conference has adopted uh, over the last decade is unique. Uh, it's certainly unique in the United States, maybe unique in the world. And, and it really is a model for continuous improvement of place. You have an organization within the Allegheny Conference called the Pittsburgh Regional Alliance that markets the region for business investment. Part of what we do is act as a single point of contact to help facilitate the information that businesses need and talent needs to make the right decision to uh, consider Pittsburgh, the Pittsburgh metropolitan area, as a place to locate. Turn it over to the Pennsylvania Economy League of Greater Pittsburgh, which is another organization within the conference umbrella. Leadership of the conference said we, we need to make sure we have complete and correct data when we make decisions. Then we can turn it over to the Greater Pittsburgh Chamber of Commerce, which also lives within our umbrella. And the Chamber of Commerce acts as our advocate in Harrisburg and in Washington, D.C., and with government in general. And the Chamber can go to, to government and seek investment, can seek laws change, regulations change, whatever it takes to create a new and improved Pittsburgh a region. And really powering that wheel is the Allegheny Conference itself. It's the 300 plus members of the organization who provide the time, talent, and the resources is to make it all possible. But it's an integrative approach, approach that's really built on private sector leadership to continuously improve a place. And there really is no other model like it in the United States. To think of what Pittsburghers enjoy now, it's important to recall what Pittsburghers knew in the past. Smoke so dense that it created darkness at noon floods that inundated downtown on a regular basis, water quality that was suspect at best. And now... Pittsburgh is now generally acknowledged as America's most livable city. Oftentimes when we have visitors uh, come into Pittsburgh when this is the first time, the first comment is, this is not at all what I expected. And we're seeing tremendous vitality restored to places like the South Side, to East Liberty, to Lawrenceville. And Pittsburgh is not just voted as livable in newspaper polls. People are voting with their feet. They're moving back to the city because they see a positive future. I'm actually a resident of downtown Pittsburgh. I, I, I'm one of those folks who left the suburbs and moved into downtown. Um, and yet when I came out of college at Robert Morris, I, I never would have imagined that downtown would have ever been a possibility for me to live in. The heart of livability is quality of life. And that is what distinguishes the new Pittsburgh from the old. A higher quality of life uh, that involves not only the education, 
uh, but also j the creation of jobs, the economic stability, the economic diversification, uh, the involvement of uh, everybody working together for the betterment of the region. And so I think when, whether it's a business leader, whether it's a political leader, uh, I think folks think long term and they think of the legacy that they're leaving behind, not just for what happens today and not just what it means for us today, but really what it means in the future. Pittsburgh has always been a city of neighborhoods and the future of the city will be no less so. Over the last 20 or 30 years, uh, community development corporations have sprung up in many of Pittsburgh's 88 neighborhoods. And they've become a new force in the way we think about community development here in Pittsburgh. More recently, Pittsburgh has taken the lead in helping others understand the unique path that we have followed. In 2013, the annual Remaking Cities Conference brought public officials, planners, and academicians from around the world to learn from Pittsburgh. And the Remaking City Conference tries to bring in the people who have been playing this city development game for a long time, learn from each other, learn what's happening here, and learn what's happening around the world, and trying to make cities adapt to a changing environment, a technological environment, a changing economic environment, and certainly a changing political environment. There's a balance between involving in collaboration and leadership. And if you're gonna change fundamentally the direction of things, there needs to be some leadership. The Allegheny Conference has provided strong leadership during the three renaissances that not only have made Pittsburgh America's most livable city, but have enabled Pittsburgh to be the hub of the revitalization of the entire region. Yet there is no sense among the board or the staff of the conference that its work is done. How do we continue to make Pennsylvania, uh, the state if not southwestern Pennsylvania, a better place to do business? to attract businesses into our region, to provide the economic stimulus and the job opportunities where we can attract more people to the region. Jobs, of course, are the first building blocks, but more remains to be done to achieve full economic development. To develop highly targeted training for very specific jobs that we know are going to be open, but to get those jobs, you have to get those skills. So we have to educate people about that, but then we have to provide the training opportunities as well. We've talked about two or three key challenges that we think could uh, slow the momentum that the region has built. One of them is infrastructure, roads, bridges, rail, transportation, air service, sites available for business expansion, and the need for a thoughtful public-private investment in those. Do we have the best education system? Do we have the best transportation system? Do we have an international airport that's filled with uh, passengers? No. So the conference could play a very constructive role in helping to undo the inequality and the racial segregation and the marginalization of many aspects of the African American and other poor communities in this city to lift everybody up. It all rolls back to education. Healthcare. The need for diversity. What about housing downtown? And we need a light rail system that goes throughout all of Allegheny County. And so what will it take? It will take the continued leadership of the conference in promoting the partnership of government with the private sector and in seeking support from the foundations and the universities. Most of all, it will take a broad vision. As we try to build consensus around important ideas around transportation, around economic development and workforce development, we need partners who can go beyond our geographic basis. We need partners that can go beyond Allegheny County's borders and be able to start to build consensus as a region because at the end, we live or die as a region. We are not competing against each other. We're competing against other regions nationally and soon internationally. Let's talk about it as public policy and let's solve this together 
as a regional population of the city of Pittsburgh and the region of Pittsburgh. We're not going to rest on our laurels. I mean, that's, that's the beginning of the end when you start thinking that you've arrived. I don't think we've arrived. We've got plenty of challenges left, and, and I certainly am going to continue to try to push the organization to tackle the big problems and, and solve them.